Let's kind of change gears, I guess, a little bit into uh, inflation. Mm -hmm. So we hear that that's kind of lurking kind of in the grassy knoll. Um, how does inflation affect me? Where Where is it in relation to where you would like it to be or however? So I guess we'll kind of go with yeah. what, you know, what is inflation in general? So to be very econ professor, uh, <laughs> inflation is when the money price, like this literal sticker price of everything goes up because it goes up. I mean, the, the, the equivalent of what thing about inflation would be, if you think of, uh, if you've ever been to Japan, everything's in yen, right? And the yen's about a hundred of the, a hundred yen to the dollar. So if you walked around in Japan, you look in this bottle of water, you're like, oh my God, that's 500 yen. So whatever. Uh, it's an airport bottle of water. It's five bucks here. It's 500 yen. Like, oh my God, it's, whew, it's 500 is a lot. Like, well, it's, yeah, but okay. But they hand out yen almost like Monopoly money, right? right. Like it's, it's, who cares? It's just the zeros, right? Um, and so inflation is like that. Like what if we multiplied every price in the economy by a factor of 10? Okay. If it happened kind of overnight and instantaneously, You'd be like, all right, everything. And that includes your wage. That includes everything goes up by a factor of 10. That would be true inflation. It just, oh, all of a sudden we, we operate on kind of the yen system. Everything's a hundred times more than it was before. It's like, all right, oh, a, a new car is five, you know, is, is, it's five million. Oh, oh my God. Yeah. But your, <laughs> your, but your salary is a million, right? Like all of a sudden it's not as, you know, you're notionally on paper a millionaire, but it doesn't really matter because the prices are all 100 times higher too. That's right. kind of real inflation, which doesn't actually conceptually have a, wouldn't have a big impact. All the prices are the same relative to one another. Your income's the same relative to the gallon of milk, relative to gas, relative to the price of a car. So in that sense, it's, it's just how we, it's, it's just what's the, the, the number we're using, what's the units we're using. Okay. Most of what's happening from the pandemic and the, the, the spike that we see in the inflation rate is, is more localized changes in relative prices. It's, you know, building materials are way up. Cars and used cars shot way up. There's some food. Infl I mean, we use the word inflation really loosely. From an economist's perspective, we use the word inflation incorrectly as a public. Okay. Because we talk about it. anything anytime the price of anything goes up, we're like, oh, it's inflation. Like, well, not technically. It's a price change. Milk got more expensive relative to the rest of the food you buy. Gas mm. got more expensive relative to the rest of the stuff you buy. What we're really bad at, and you'll notice we never talk about this, is no one ever has a story about, hey, did you ever notice that gas went down? <laughs> Every now and then you'll get a story like, wow, gas hit $2 or it was under $2. I occasionally get that. I've never seen a story that said, wow, milk's really cheap. Yeah, go buy some milk. It's really go buy some hot Stock up, right? Like milk's, <laughs> you know, it's under two dollars a gallon. We pay a lot of attention to relative price changes on this on the way up because they're relative price changes, and they're that means they're skewing something in our lives, right? Milk got really expensive. I like milk. Well, crap! Now I have to give up something in order to get as much milk as I wanted. So it's less Cheetos and more milk. Crap! That sucks, right? Like that, and that does suck. It doesn't mean that there's some fundamental underlying problem right? The spike in inflation we've seen recently comes from a few particular areas, some of which are recovering the drops in prices that happened last year. So airline uh, tickets, I think, had a big inflationary spike a couple months ago. You're like, oh my God, it's like 10% inflation. Like, well, yeah, they it's like 15% drop in airline fares a year ago. I don't think about that. Yeah. So the inflation is kind of measured, it's, not necessarily. Exactly. So you think about like the level of the price, it dropped a bunch after, you know, in the summer after COVID, say airline tickets. And so it's accelerated a lot and it's inflated a lot. It's not even back to where it was in March, 2020. Mm. So the change is really shocking to see on a number of these, these commodities and items, but it's in most cases, it's just kind of getting back to and just barely above where it was in 2020. So I think most of what we've, we're seeing, this is why a lot of economists will tell you, like, this is just us climbing back to where we would have been. Okay. Right. We're just, we're running really fast because the prices were so low that they're coming back to where we would have guessed they would have been without the pandemic. So that doesn't really scare 
some economists a lot. So that yeah, it seems almost kind of like a good sign if they're it is, feeling right? like good it, about raising prices. There's elements again. of it that are like, well, if 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 we're back to where the price levels were pre-pandemic, that probably means things are sorting themselves out. Which doesn't change the fact that it's surprising week to week to go in and say, crap, man, that milk is more expensive. It is. Like, it doesn't change the <laughs> fact that it does cost more to buy milk and you got to make choices now, right? But but what seems to be happening is more of these relative price changes. It's, you know, we've seen things fundamentally change in the pandemic. You know, a lot of people are not going back to work at old jobs that they were before and restaurants and places are now like, well, I got to charge more or I got to charge more to pay the wages to get the people to work, you know? So there's relative price changes like mm. that happening. That's not really inflation. It's not Argentina, you know, Zimbabwe, like, oh my God, we're, we got barrel full, you know, wheelbarrows full of cash right. that we need. No, it's, it's the economy resorting itself. And we're surprised to see certain things becoming more expensive relative to others. Uh, and that's shocking, but it also means some things are becoming cheaper relative to others yeah uh, which is good yeah which is good if you if you like those things right some people benefit out of these changes some people don't um so how is the inflation uh used as an economic lever sometimes you hear about that in relation right. to I, I think it's or i guess it'd more be the interest rates i guess to yeah control i the mean inflation. like we kind of think about interest rates as being like the instrument we use and then inflation rate is kind of this it's an indicator of kind of how we're, I don't want to say how we're doing because it's, it's, it's just an indicator of whether we're getting things about right in terms of balancing the, the funds and the money that we have out there to transact all the goods and services with the amount of goods and services we're transacting, right? So what we want is, what I, what I want is to listen to podcasts and drink bottles of water and drive my car and eat the cheeseburger and fries. And I want to do stuff. I want things. I want services like this. I want that stuff. It makes it really efficient if rather than trading this bottle of water for the podcast or, you know, whatever to, you know, trade, I'll trade you some water if you can let me use your car for a five. That's hard, right? It's hard to find all those coincidences. So we use cash, right? We use money to grease these process of having us buy goods and services from one another. And that makes it super efficient because now I can walk into Target with this <laughs> worthless piece of paper, right? Worthless green piece of paper. And I said, I'll give you this if you give me the case of water. And they give me the water. It's insane. <laughs> That's nice of them. Even better, I can stick a plastic <laughs> card that is worthless in a machine. And it's like, yeah, sure, take the water. <laughs> I'm like, all right, so you got nothing from me. You got digits removed from a notional account at a bank somewhere on a server. And I got water. This is amazing, right? And in return, somewhere along the way, U of H gives me digits in this, gives me nothing for the fact that I show up on a day-to-day -day basis and get up and teach class and everything, right? But none of those make sense because you're literally, I'm stealing water from Target. I give them a plastic card. I don't even give them the card. It's like, here's the card. And they're like, all right, cool. You're good. <laughs> the thing is though, that because we're trading these useless bits or pieces of paper, if we, if the kind of the amount of those bits and pieces of paper get out of line with the amount of goods and services, so then you get true inflation, right? Like if we just pumped money into the economy, we started oh, yeah. printing hundred dollar bills and just mailed them to everybody. And since those things can be used to go steal stuff from Target, essentially, well, all the prices would get bid up, right? And all of a sudden we'd be Japan and everything would be 500 rather than five. Right. Okay, so the Fed and other people are watching to say, are, is the money getting out of, out of pace with the pace of the real goods and services that we, that we want? And if it gets out of pace, then, then those prices inflate. We start looking like Japan. And the reason we usually want to avoid that is that just, it's just hard to process. Businesses, they need to print price lists. They need to, I, you know, you're, the kid at Target, when you get into these hyperinflations, imagine working at Target in a hyperinflation. Every hour they're sending you out into every aisle with the gun to be like, you got to, you know, I got to reprice that. I got to, <laughs> like, I need the stickers. And I, it's just a pain in the butt, right? It doesn't, it doesn't help people plan. Uh, you kind of have a notion of relative prices in your head. If right. everything's going up all over the place, it's hard to keep track. So we kind of don't want the money that greases the wheels here to run ahead of how much activity we actually have. 
Gotcha. So that's why we watch inflation and why we care that it doesn't get out of hand or like a little bit of inflation. Fine. That's, that's totally cool. Um, but we don't want, we don't want to end up in this world where we get with, you know, it's 20, 30, 40, 50, a hundred percent inflation. Right. Cause then we see all you do is pay attention to come finding the slips of paper as opposed to actually doing things for goods and services. Gotcha. So we pay a lot of attention to inflation for that reason, but it's, I, I think it's like the medical analogy is it's, it might be like, yeah, it's it's like having a heart rate monitor, right? And you're like, okay, no, all right, you know, 65, 70 beats per minute. I'm good, all right, we're fine. But if, if my watch spikes up and I'm sitting here and all of a sudden it's like, dude, your heart's doing 175, <laughs> like, oh, crap, I'm having an issue, right? right. Like that's, then it would be indicative to me that there's something wrong. So I think inflation's kind of like the heart rate monitor. It's like, oh, just keep an eye on it as long as it's in the normal range nothing to worry about. You seem perfectly healthy. The economy's moving. If it spikes for a long period of time out of nowhere, and the, the recent spike is not ridiculously large, mm -hmm. uh, like if it's like 20, 30%, then you're like, oh crap, you're having a heart attack or the equivalent. I think it's also too, right? I mean, if the prices are going up and then the wages aren't, then I guess that can kind of and this is where and this is where people get hung up on it, which is, hey, I see prices going up, but I just didn't get a raise. Right. And so, yeah, you're right. Your relative price of your labor just fell compared to the price of mm. milk and everything else. If it's true inflation, everything went up, including your wage. So you're Japan, right? Japanese oh, okay. people aren't necessarily poor because everything's priced a hundred times higher. Their wages are a hundred times higher too. Oh, right. Okay. You know, like someone earning $50,000 in the U S would earn 500,000 yen in Japan. It's not like they're poor. So, but in the transition, right? This is why we don't like high inflation partially because it takes, yeah. not everything goes up all at the same time. So all of a sudden, all the prices of the goods and services spike, but your wage hasn't caught up because you only get a raise once a year at best, right? Mm -hmm. Or I got to wait for my personality evaluation, right? Or <laughs> a lot of this, we just don't operate that fast, right? right? On the wage side, usually. Uh, whereas on the product side, you know, Target can run around now even faster. They probably just have to push a button and change yeah, the price. In some places, yeah, they actually have kind of those uh, yeah, the LED little, little screens. Yeah, so it, are they can change the prices like that. So <laughs> gas is the other example. The guy used to be right, like out there with the big pole, right? They can change it at lunch during the day if he wants. <laughs> so we pay attention to those because they're so visible. I think. Yeah, it's a good point. Whereas things, other things like our wage, are really sticky. Mm -hmm. And it takes a while to adjust. So in regards to wages, um, I think maybe there might be some kind of, you know, correction going on over the yeah. years in regards to wages. But uh, um, are we still needing more increases in regards to, and is it just kind of a spike? I mean, I can't imagine that somebody saying, well, I mean, that job was, you know, worth that last year, but I'm willing to take less or, you know, I, just, I, I mean, it's kind right, of, this is kind of fascinating, right? Like, I mean, need is a, re is a weird word. Like, I don't know that the economy needs, in particular, anything. Like, we, it is what it is. But I, it's fascinating to me to watch this because you would think, as an economist, I would have thought, or we, you know, we normally think, well, look, it's, it's a labor market. If people were unhappy with their situation or their job in, over the last 10 years, the little, they would have quit, they would have moved and that would have sent signals and wages would have crept up and we would have gone from, you know, waiters and waitresses making whatever the base is like 250 and tips or whatever. And that would have crept up and some places would be paying $10 an hour fixed or whatever. And that would have just happened, but it doesn't. It appears to take kind of a big <laughs> mental shift, I guess. Right. And that seems to be what kind of the pandemic did is it kind of, you know, full breaks, full stop on everything. And it sure seems like it allowed people or gave people the opportunity to step back and be like, Hey, wait a second. I didn't quit and I didn't complain and, and nothing changed for these 10 years, 20 years. I mean, you can go back to the early eighties when median wages started stagnating and say like, we've gone through a long period and it you know what? It sucks to have a, a kind of lower level job. The pay is pretty crappy. You can't afford very much with it. The Now, all of a sudden, it's the hours are variable. It's like they call you the day before to tell you whether you're working or not. Uh, there's no benefits because you're a contractor, not an employee. I mean, like all these things have been ripped they away. They start stacking up. Yeah. yeah. And maybe, this, maybe it just took an event like this for a bunch of people to say, hey, wait a second. This is 
BS. And I think we see that, right? You see, there's been a bunch of strikes this month, even yeah. after, right? And this is fascinating. Even after all the extra unemployment support lapsed, you still don't, you still had historic levels of quits. Uh, and you've got people and the job market, you know, there's still more openings than there are people uh, who are looking. It's, it's not like everybody said, oh, crap, I'm not getting my, my free money. I'm going to go back to work. Everyone's holding out. It seems like, no, you got to treat us like with some respect. So it's some that's like big resort of the, the labor management kind of relationship or deal mm -hmm. going on kind of all at once. Like I said, I would have thought that it would have occurred over time, but apparently it's just all going to happen. Yeah. I went to a water burger and they're yeah. like, Hey, sorry, we're understaffed. It's yeah. going to take like 20 minutes to it's, get you. And I looked over to the person who was just getting their burger. I'm like, how long did it take you? And she said 45 minutes. Yeah. And the buns like rock hard. It's, it's, it's every like, place. Right. Because you know, the, and they're both stuck, right? Like the Whataburger is stuck because the whole business model is built on thinking they're going to pay whatever it was, seven bucks an hour, eight bucks an hour on average to a, your average kid working at Whataburger. Well, if I got to, if I'm going to have to pay 14 or 15 bucks an hour to get people in there, that changes my, uh, like, I'm going to have to raise prices. I'm going yeah, to have burger to, def definitely my, my rent's more. not going down. So I, I, right. So, and they don't want to necessarily bust that onto the, cons their customers who are used to a six dollar burger and we're like yeah it's gonna be ten dollars now and they're like well what happened i'm like i can't pay i gotta pay people yeah so all these things have to like trip over but yeah you see this everywhere it's and i think it's particularly come up with jobs that are quote crappy jobs and i think food service food service is a crappy job it's a tough Honestly, one yeah it's a, hard, a tough one tough hard one. <laughs> job and especially in the pandemic i think we threw a lot of those people under the bus and so like, you got to come to work Yeah, that's and there's going to be a bunch of people breathing at you and you're in an unsafe situation and you don't have health care and all this kind of stuff. So I think maybe it just, some people are like, you know what? I've had it. Yeah. I've had it. But now we have to live through the kind of resorting of this. Um, and so, yeah, it's Whataburger's got to decide, am I going to charge my customers more and pay these people or am I going to shut down? Yeah. And then I guess as customers, we have to decide, you know, yeah. is it worth it? Because exactly. I mean, you know, is the experience going to change? I mean, right. you know, it's like. <laughs> well, and, and for a lot of people, we think, you know, it's, you think of yourself and, you know, it's, oh, well, it's not like my wage is going up, but you think of like Whataburger's customers. A lot of them are not, not some of them are Whataburger employees and a lot of them are employees at other places like that. So we've seen this in the the uh, places that have done fifteen dollar an hour minimum wage mandates, Seattle, L.A., a couple yeah, other places, right? Seems to be a movement. Yeah, they uh, they don't experience big uh, declines in employment. Uh, in some sense, they haven't had big spikes in employment either. But okay, but what seems to happen is is that the initial income of those people gets spent at the other businesses that are minimum wage places, so they make the money through board business that they, so everything kind of just keeps moving around. Now it's, right. it's a bit of a transfer from business owners to employees and, and from customers who aren't part of that minimum wage world to minimum wage employees. Like now I'm paying $10 for a Whataburger. Okay. Well, I think that if you, if I was on that labor side of that, I would make that explicit. I'd be like, look, I'm holding out for $15 an hour. And I'm asking you guys all to pay a little more for a burger so that I can, you know, afford daycare for my kid or can afford to, you know, get, go to the dentist or can pay my rent. And I think a lot of people, and this is the part of it, I think a lot of people are sympathetic to that because yeah, a lot definitely. of people are, have been or oh, are yeah. close worked. to that situation, yeah. right? Like I got a good job now, but I worked, I worked food service, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, I, <did. laughs> like I know it's crappy. I'm happy. Like I, I always try and tip well. Yeah. For the reason that I know it sucks. So I, if you told me that my, my restaurant meals would be 50% more from now on, I would, I personally, I'd be like, all right, yeah. If it's going to these guys, yeah, well, help them let's, out, let's do it. I'd rather do it that way than tell me you're going to run some extra tax scheme and take it and then worry about passing out checks and stuff. Like, yeah, is I, it right? Raise the minimum wage. Let me pay these people kind of a sense funds directly by yeah. patronizing those businesses. It's a lot easier, yeah. The money stays with those families. It's directly into their paychecks. They spend it locally. I'm That's to me, is an efficient way of of doing some of the redistribution, as opposed to some massive 
overarching federal program or something where we, we pick it around and, and, and have to identify people.